Hi, everyone. Welcome again to the Borderline Personality Disorder Family and Consumer Education Webinar Series. My name is Chris Palmer. I'm a psychiatrist here at McLean Hospital and the director of this education initiative. My pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. We are joined today by Dr. Martin Bohus, who is an internationally recognized expert in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder and using DBT in that treatment. And he's going to be speaking with us today on the overlap between borderline personality disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder and how to go about diagnosing and treating those uh, disorders when they are comorbid. Um, he is the chair of psychosomatic medicine and psychotherapy at Heidelberg University on the medical faculty of Mannheim and also the scientific director at the Institute of Psychiatric and Psychosomatic Psychotherapy um, in Mannheim. Uh, and so that's in Germany. He comes to us all the way from Germany. He happens to be visiting us. So we are really honored and delighted that he's joined us today. Before we get started, just a couple of logistical announcements. Um, we do want this to be as interactive as possible. So if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to use the Q&A box to type those in. All of your identities and emails and phone numbers have been hidden from other participants, so you can be confidential. Um, and uh, in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a lot of links to different websites. That first one is a link to our homepage where all of our webinars are archived and you can also register for upcoming webinars. That next link for the April 26th webinar is obviously to register for our very next one. And then the next three uh, resources uh, focus on general information about borderline personality disorder. So if you're interested in learning more or if you are looking for a clinician in your area, some of those Websites have resources along those lines. And then finally, I just want to acknowledge that this entire initiative has been made possible through a philanthropic gift from a family affected by borderline personality disorder. We'd love to be able to continue them. Uh, if you are in a position to be able to give a gift, large or small, to help support these webinars, we would welcome that. And there's a link to be able to support these webinars. And without further ado, I welcome to the webinar Dr. Martin Bohas. So hello, it's my pleasure, my, I've been very honored to stay here and to give this webinar. Uh, just to give you a little bit of my personal background, I've dedicated my entire career to the understanding and of the psychopathology of borderline people and um, improving the treatment. We're running a large borderline clinic with about 50 residential treatment places and about 1,000 outpatient uh, treatment places and um, we're also running large center grants mo mainly directed on uh, the improvement of the understanding of the mechanisms, the neuropsychological mechanisms of emotion regulation, complicated interpersonal behavior and uh, a co-occurring uh, PTSD in this group of patients. Um, this is why I'm here, and I'm very proud to be here. Now I have to do something. Yep. Okay, this is my first webinar, so be a little bit patient with me. Um, so, okay, this is the content what we're doing. I, first, I will a little bit explain about the specific symptomatology of borderline patients with co-occurring PTSD, and then I will tell you about the design of the treatment we have developed and uh, of the data we have. So actually we've been working since 2003, this is meanwhile 15 years in the development of that treatment and uh, the data I can show you are fresh out of the press so it's really time to present it. Uh, of course I didn't do this alone, there's a huge team uh, behind me few names just dropping, it's Regina Steil and Kathleen Briebe and Annie Dyer, just to let you know that of course I'm not alone, so it's a huge team to do this. So if we talk about the classical borderline domains, and I, I've been told that most of you uh, at the audience 
already know about the borderline symptomatology in the major borderline domains. Maybe you're affected yourself, maybe you're a family member, maybe you are somebody who's involved in treatment. Usually we subdivide the borderline pathology in three major domains. The first is on the right hand, this is this disturbed emotion regulation. Then it comes to disturb self-concepts and disturb social cooperation and um, social interaction. Different schools have different opportunity what's the major topic, but in general uh, for the patient itself it doesn't play a role what is major and what is minor. So most of them are really disturbed by all three of those domains. And then what is the most impressive attitude for those who are dealing with borderline patients or is always this so-called maladaptive behavior from our perspective, this so-called maladaptive behavior are uh, yeah, a little bit insufficient solutions. This is how patients try to cope with their disturbed emotion regulation and the self-concept. And this behavior has the disadvantage that it has some negative feedback loops. This means to try to have a short-term resolution for, let's say, a strong aversive tension. People try to cut themselves or something like that or, or have aggressive outbursts. This has negative feedbacks on the entire system. So this is a self-perpetuating um, uh, circle which makes often things worse. So this is the classic borderline domains and uh, everybody is aware that, let's say, the safe turf disturbances are designed by negative self-concepts marked by persistent beliefs about oneself as diminished, defeated, worthless, and this can be accompanied by deep and pervasive feelings of shame and guilt. I think these are the major feelings playing the major role in borderline personality disorder. It's not that much anger, it's mostly shame and guilt or self-contempt. And um, when it comes to the interpersonal levels, um, a lot of people have difficulties in sustaining their relationships, difficulties in feeling close to others, and um, yeah, sometimes they have really hard time to, to develop, let's say, sustaining uh, uh, trust. And uh, the affective domain is the currently best investigated domain. All those patients are characterized by very high emotional reactivity, um, sometimes violent outbursts, sometimes reckless or self-destructive behavior. And what's very important is for when it comes to the trauma, most of those patients report about prolonged dissociative states when under stress. What is dissociation? Dissociation is a, um, mostly a short-term stress-related interruption of um, our conscious feeling of self, of time, of space. We feel as if the world around of us gets different or numb or one-dimensional and we lose the contact to what we call reality. This is an an intermittent uh, uh, stress-related state. It's not a continuous state. And uh, yeah, and lots of our patients have also really problems with experience positive emotions. So some some of them are really phobic of positive emo emotions. Means that they have short-time positive emotions, and then they do the very best to skip it again and uh, skip to more aversive emotions. Yeah, where does it all come from? Ex exactly, and nobody really can tell you. Um, there are several different theories. Um, some think that genetic plays an important role. We don't have really robust data that genetic plays an important role. Um, it's very different from, let's say, other psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder where you can clearly say that uh, it's a genetic transmission. We don't see this in borderline patients. We have a, a few ideas that it might have to be something with a genetic driven uh, emotional vulnerability, but even that is not clear. What we really know is that if we ask about childhood experience that patients report about a whole bunch of aversive or adverse um, interpersonal violence 
And um, if you look at that graph, this graph is uh, German population treatment seeking female borderline patients. We have you know, it's a me mediocre end size, 260. And about 60% report about sexual abuse. About 40% report about physical abuse. And about 35% uh, report about witnessing violence between their parents. And what the big deal here is this large overlap. So as you see this here in this, uh, you don't see the surface. So you see, m if somebody has experienced sexual abuse, the probability that he also has experienced physical abuse or witnessing violence is quite high. So, and, but that's very important. We have about 25% who don't, do not report this adverse side effect. So this means it's much too short to say borderline per se result is a result or a sequela of childhood sexual abuse. This is not true. Uh, I know many patients who, who come of very nice and friendly families and um, so it's much too short to say, uh, and I think it's important that um, our family members not, uh, don't uh, think that we as developers and researchers think that they are guilty uh, per se for inducing borderline personality disorder. However, there is a group of patients who have been sexual or physically abused. So this is, we don't have to neglect this case. And uh, if somebody has a proneness for borderline personality disorder and it comes to physical or sexual abuse, the probability to develop severe PTSD is quite high. So in our clinical populations, in Europe and in the States, we see that about 50 up to 60 percent of this population is suffering from a co-occurring PTSD. If you do the open field studies, about 30 percent meet these criteria. Means that those with a co-occurring or PTSD are suffering more and show more psychopathology and have a higher um, probability for, uh, for chronification and bad outcome, and long-term bad outcome, if you don't treat it. This is why you see them more in the residential treatment or in the inpatient uh, unit. So, if somebody has a co-occurring PTSD, you have to add a fourth domain. So, to this emotion regulation, this functional self-concept, and this dysfunctional this social cooperation, you have to add what we call disturbed memory processing. What do you mean with disturbed memory processing? If somebody is suffering from PTSD, they experience mostly very many intrusions or flashbacks. What are intrusions? Intrusions are memories which can be optical, or even sensory uh, memories, or a kind of sensory memories, like odors or something, which remind you very strong of this trauma, and you cannot control this memory, and sometimes this memory is so strong that it feels completely vivid and overwhelming, and the poor patient cannot discriminate between the present and the past. This means it feels like this trauma is right now happening again. This is what we call flashback. And if you look at the frequency of this, this is uh, just data we have published, um, and we collected data with, a, now we call it ambulatory assessment. This means little tiny computer tools ask you every hour or every second hour, please report me shortly. Uh, did you experience any uncontrollable uh, memories or flashbacks? Then you see that the, 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 the medium of, uh, of the, the frequency is about 70 or even more flashbacks and intrusions per week. This means about 10 intrusions per day. This means more or less every hour one, which costs you tons of energy. It's very, very, very unpleasant and you feel completely overwhelmed and lots of control. And this is more or less dominating and scripting your life. 
So you can imagine that if you if you're suffering from a severe PTSD, you don't have much energy energy to let's say do your educational process or to work or something else. Most of the time, your brain acts as if you are currently traumatized, and your whole physiological system acts as if you are traumatized. This means you are in the very very high levels of stress, and you run around and have the implicit feeling that you have to protect yourself for whatever happens. And people arrange their lives uh, in order to avoid these flashbacks and these intrusions, and they start to de deliver and uh, to develop a, what we call a vita minimum. This means, uh, of course, they avoid body contacts. Many of them avoid crowds where male beings are around. Uh, or queuing in the supermarket or in the railway stations or even going out of their house, uh, they avoid and they, they, this avoidance is increasing and increasing. So after a while, they really start to, 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 to yeah, develop something, a very close life in a, in a nutshell and uh, of course is far away from what we call um, a life worth living or a life, a meaningful life according to one's values. So, what is important is, you, I think you might be aware that for borderline personality disorder in general, we now do have, fortunately do have, um, three or four really good evidence-based treatments. This treatment with the best evidence is DBT, dialectic behavior therapy, developed by my close friend and teacher, Marshall Linehan. And, uh, so, and I think it's a good treatment. It's a very good treatment. It's not sufficient. We have to improve it all the time. But whenever you can get it and you have born and take it. However, if you have a co-occurring PTSD, then you only have a 13% probability that you achieve diagnostic remission during one year treatment of DBT. This means more or less one of 10 or 10 of 100. This is much too less if you think that this is really dominating your life. So uh, it was Melanie Hornet of the group of, of, of Marshall Linehan who did the first research data and she, she clearly came up with, the, with uh, the findings that DBT per se the class activity is not sufficient to treat it, nor is any other of the established treatments. Neither uh, mentalization-based treatment nor TFP ever have shown that uh, they, have, uh, they can reduce the burden of co-occurring PTSD. And <coughs> we know that co-occurring PTSD predicts bad or worse outcome across the course of any other treatment. It's less improvement in suicidal and self-interest behavior. It's a lower likelihood of eliminating acute suicide risks. And it's a higher risk of emergency unit intakes. So quite interesting. There has been a, a move in the diagnostic systems um, right now in, in the last month or half year may be aware there are two diagnostic systems in the world. The one is the DSM, which is mostly distributed in the States. However, the rest of the world is, has a diagnostic system called ICD-11, uh, ICD-10, or the International Diagnostic System. And there's a revision every 10 years or something like that. And with the newest revision, they come up with a new diagnostic and entity. And this new diagnostic entity is called Complex PTSD. Complex PTSD differs from classic PTSD, like which is designed, uh, which is um, characterized by re-experiencing of traumatic memories, trying to avoid the stimuli, what's clear, and the sense of threat. A classic PTSD is more. Most people develop, let's say, if you have a severe car accident, if you are a victim of a rape. Uh, or even warriors, if you have, uh, if you go to war and uh, and you are have uh, um, severe bomb attacks or something like that, some of them can develop 
PTSD, this is classic PTSD. If it comes to complex PTSD, you have the same three um, uh, PTSD items plus real problems with self-organization. This means problems in affect dysregulation, negative self-concept, and interpersonal disturbances. So you see, it's exactly, exactly, 100% the same description as borderline patients plus PTSD. So we have now two diagnostic systems. The one is called complex PTSD, which describes exactly the same problematic like borderline patients have if they are traumatized. What is important that all these uh, characteristics are pervasive. This means they occur various contexts and relationships regardless of the proximity to the traumatic reminders. And this is, okay. So, for an example, I can show you here, if we ask our patients in Freiburg, when, uh, in Mannheim, when we start the treatment, and we ask them, when you think about yourself, what em emotions show up? These are traumatized patients. And then you see the black bars here uh, is the level of disgust, of guilt, of shame, of anger, sadness, general distress, fear, and helplessness. And the white ones are, we call it healthy trauma control. This means these are people who, who had experienced sexual traumatization but never developed any kind of psychiatric disorder. That happens if you're lucky. These are highly resilient people and maybe they have some better circumstances, family circumstances. I don't know exactly, nobody knows. But what you see here is that there are two major emotions. This is guilt and shame. Guilt and shame are the, the major issues, but, um, and the, the major emotions which prone the whole self-perception. How does that come? And I think it's quite important to have a deeper understanding why do kids or adolescents who are uh, experiencing or grown up in a field of interpersonal violence or emotional neglect, how, how do they develop uh, this very dysfunctional self-concept? But if you look that at this mechanism, uh, at, at this development from an evolution psychology, from a psychological evolutionary perspective, it may start to make sense. Just imagine a girl growing up in a family where she's been continuously abused from the age of, let's say, five to eight. Um, the first thing this kid has to do is to survive. And as you all know from the press, not every kid survives. In Germany, we know that in 80, we have 80 million uh, people there, and every week one kid is killed by their parents, every week. I think this figure should be quite higher in the States. So it's not clear that you survive, and if you are in this situation, you don't know whether you survive or not. The only thing you know is that there's something very disgusting, very, very, very awful, very painful happening. And for that, your self-protective system is highly activated and you are driven by fear and threat. Yeah? And uh, if you are driven by fear and threat, you have a short-term reaction. This is always feeling helpless, um, looking for help if you find something. Uh, and feeling anxious and you have a long-term reaction of fear and threat and this is you have to figure out how to protect yourself so how to protect yourself that this stops or doesn't happen again and our major let's say mechanism uh, to protect ourselves is to understand why does this happen this is how human brains work whenever something very aversive happens we immediately start rumoring why does this happen. And we come up with sometimes very clear solutions, but sometimes with very weird ideas. Let's say all our first native religious attempts were driven by our motives to, to understand why thunderstorms, earthquakes, or something happens. And so we invented natural gods or something like that. We really, yeah non very uh, causal things. However, so this is the, what the kid thinks. Why did or does this happen to me? And the second thing, what a kid has to find a solution is, 
how can I stay in this family? And this is important to, 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 to know. For a kid at the age of five or eight, there is no chance to leave the family. This, this, this is simply no, no opportunity in your brain. Um, this starts at the age of 12, 13. If you start as adolescent, you can start about fantasizing leaving, leaving your family, living with your friends, or doing something else. But age, earlier ages are completely dependent that you stay in your family. This is a question of survival. Our brain results from a long evolutionary period where it was clear that you die if you don't stay within your family. So a kid has two things. The one is, why does this happen? And second, how can I stay in this family? And staying in this family means also, how can I have a positive relationship to my parents? Means, how can I love my father even when he's doing these painful things to me? That's the point. And you have to find the solution. And the solution that they usually have the first is always, this is normal. This happens. And these perpetrators tell their kids and say, listen, yeah, yeah, fathers have to do things like that. And so they grow up in the fam in their peer family, and they think, okay, this is normal. After a while, they meet others. They meet in the kindergarten or in the preschool or in the school, and they, they, they have some chance to other families. And then they get aware that, oh, sometimes fathers are nice, and uh, it, it seems li like there is no sexual something within these other families. So then they start saying, okay, this is normal, at least in our families. That means our family is different from other families. And kids have a very, very fine and sensitive feeling whether their families, families are different from other families. So they are different. And this feel of being different than any other is results in, a, in an emotion. This emotion is called shame. Then, as they grow up a little bit, they start to consider themselves as wrong. I am somehow wrong. Something is wrong with me. And the emotion is the same. It's shame. I'm worse than I should be. And the third cognition, the basic assumption is, I did something wrong. I did something wrong, this is the reason why it happened. So this is a pseudo-causal explanation. This helps against the feeling of powerlessness, since things come a little bit clearer. And the resulting emotion is guilt. So these are the two major emotions, shame and guilt. So these two emotions are what I would call the first defense lines against the, uh, uh, the feeling of powerlessness. And of course, shame is, and guilt is better tolerable than powerlessness and non predictableness and the, this sense of losing control. However, these two emotions have a price. The price is that these are social emotions. And these social emotions mean that you are worse and, uh, and different than others. And if the others see how bad you are, they will exclude you and they will reject you. And uh, this is why the whole system run, results in the severe disturbance of the social affiliative system. So, what is to wrap it up means you have two problems. <coughs> if you are a victim of early sexual abuse, on the one hand, your self protective system is extremely highly activated and you, uh, and you are, let's say, your hypersensitivity to any kind of threat. You are not able to, re to develop trust. You have real troubles if it comes to um, closeness and, um, and uh, yeah, c um, closeness and relaxation. And you have a problem with the social, social affiliative system. So this means you don't trust anybody and you protect yourself of being seen by others. So, when it comes to treatment, the problem is that c before we started to develop our treatment, there were a lot of treatments on the market. There were treatments on the market who were designed for PTSD. However, if you look at this uh, exclusion uh, criteria of the most relevant uh, studies, then you see that almost anything of this, uh, of this established uh, uh, treatment 
They exclude patients with psychosis, that's clear, with substance dependence, but also with suicidality um, or depression, or many of them also uh, excluded patients with severe dissociative features. The problem is that our patients, it means borderlines who are traumatized, they are chronically suicidal and they are chronically uh, um, depressed, and mo many of them use, are, are substance abusers, and sometimes they have psychotic features. What means that this population is exclude, has been excluded from the most of the established treatments. So this means there was no treatment, and this is the situation you're familiar with, this old trend. Those patients simply didn't fit in. So what you do? We develop a new treatment, and we call it dbt PTSD. We call it dbt PTSD since it's based on the rules and principles of DBT. DBT teaches us how to motivate our patients, how to work with a little bit difficult to treat patients. And it's a skills-driven treatment. This means it provides a whole bunch of, of very, very um, useful tiny little instructions which help our patients to regulate their, their emotions, to regulate their mindfulness, and to regulate their interpersonal difficulties. However, we had to add specific trauma-focused components, which we borrowed by cognitive and exposure-based treatments, and we added some very, very helpful tools by compassion-focused therapy, developed by my good friend Paul Gilbert, who has some very nice interventions helping you to improve your self-compassion and also the compassion to others. And we took some pieces of ACT, ACT is Acceptance and, commission, uh, and Commitment Therapy. They are right quite good in developing values and uh, are good in the acceptance. All this resulted in what we call a multi-component modular treatment, which is designed A as a 12-week residential treatment program, <coughs> and B as an outpatient program with around about 45 sessions. Sounds long for an American, I know. However, if you look at the normal uh, borderline treatment, there's not one treatment which is shorter than about 40 or 50 sessions. And what's important, we take in patients, that's not here, sorry. We take in patients um, who are the severe of the severe. So we, we don't exclude patients who cut themselves. We don't exclude patients who are suicidal. We don't exclude patients who are uh, using, uh, who are substance abusers. Why? Since most of the, our patients do it. That's the easiest thing. The only, uh, the only um, inclusion criteria is that the last life-threatening suicide attempt is longer than eight weeks ago. That's it. So you, if you have a very fresh, life-threatening suicide attempt, then you should go through this suicide attempt first and, uh, and check what it happened and figure out what were the triggers and, to uh, and establish or learn some skills to cope with this. But eight weeks afterwards, you can enter this treatment. This is what we did. This means we want to have a, a completely non-exclusive treatment. Um, so this is how it is designed. It's <coughs> if you're familiar with DBT, it's a little bit different, since it's following a protocol. And you see we have seven phases. We start with the commitment phase, and then we go for motivation and planning. We give a few skills. Then the key is what we call skills-assisted exposure. I will explain it later on. Then we help our patients with radical acceptance of the past, and then a very important part is regaining your life since the good news or the bad news, this treatment is extremely effective. And within a relatively short time frame, seeing that those patients are suffering for years from this uh, problem, they completely change. And then often they have, it figures out that they have arranged their whole life around their pathology. And now all of a sudden they are much better. It's a little bit like 
if you arrange, if you are, let's say, you, uh, you're sitting in a wheelchair and you arrange your whole life um, to cope with you as a wheelchair driver, and then somebody some sh stands up and says, okay, I know how to trick you, I have some certain new surgery, and then you can walk. It's, on the one hand, it's fantastic. On the other hand, it's, you suffer a little bit and say, why didn't that happen earlier? Understandable. And the second is, the, you arranged your complete life. Your partner has been adapted to your wheelchair, your job has been adapted to your wheelchair, all your friends have been adapted to your wheelchair, they treat you like a wheelchair driver, and all of a sudden you stand up and say, no, I'm no longer. So you have to change your complete life. This is work. <laughs> and for that we added this regain your life, and then of course we have to say farewell. I hope I'm not too quick. Am I too quick? No, you, we've got about 30 minutes. I have 30 minutes? 30 more minutes. I love it. And we've got time for questions, and so you don't Good. have to... Good, okay. I hope you're still on, <laughs> on, on screen, huh? <laughs> Thank you. So, I'll lead you a little bit through, yeah? Okay? So, we start with the commitment just that you get an idea what we're doing. We start with sh very short with biography, and uh, we check the current crisis generating behavior, just that we know it, most of our patients do something. Um, we check whether they are in high risk behavior or whatever they do. And uh, of course we want to know why our patients want to go for the treatment. And then we start very early what we call compassion focused mindfulness. Since mindfulness is an extremely good brain training which enables you to start observing your automatic thoughts, your automatic cognition, your automatic uh, um, just, uh, yeah, your self-complaints and so on, uh, and not to follow them. That's, that's the most important thing. That our brain is processing its own stuff, and you don't have to follow always your brain. This is the essential of mindfulness. This means, okay, uh, you are eager to observe your brain working, but you don't have to believe every information your brain is sending you. And this is mindfulness perfectly. And if you call it compassion-focused mindfulness, means that you start to develop a stance or a view or a gestalt, yeah, um, which starts to see yourself and the world as something which is suffering and accepting the suffering of that and not thinking all the time that this was my fault, this was, I, I, I'm wrong and I'm worse, I'm suffering and then this is how it is, I have good reasons to suffer. However, even when I suffer, I have to make the best out of my life. This is the two, bad, two sides of compassion. Acceptance of suffering and um, strengthening this myself and others. This is the commitment phase. And then we start very early to understand what really happened uh, uh, to, to you. And uh, we want to know about your values and goals. Since this means the number one question is what would you do with your life if you would have to give up, not to give up, if it would disappear, your, your PTSD, it's not a question of giving up. You need help. If you could, simply could give it up, then you would have given it up. So that's the wrong phrase. Sorry, yeah, I'm German. Sometimes the wording is not exactly what I mean. Uh, so this means, what would you do with your life if you would not longer suffer from PTSD? And a lot of our patients said, I haven't the slightest idea since PTSD takes over. It's completely dominating my life. It's 24-7. And then I say, okay, just start with fantasies. What do you do? And then we are talking about the values. So it means what is really important for you. And then patients start to say, ah, I, I, for me, it's, 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 it's important to help others. So, wow, well, well, that's an important value. Others say, I want to have power or want to have money. Or others say, I want to have a good job, or I want to be a nice father, something like that. It doesn't matter. Everybody has its personal values. Some are not really aware of that. But living a life according to your values leads to the feeling of a meaningful life. And the ultimate goal of every psychotherapy is helping our clients to develop not a life worth living, but a meaningful life. This is what I would say. So we start with them and say, what would mean, what, what would it, what do we have to do to develop a meaningful life? Why do we do it? Since we want to have a strong motivational factor, since this treatment is hard. It's hard. It's very successful. 
But if you do it, you have an 80% probability to get completely rid of your PTSD. That's the point. But you have to do it. And PTSD has something to do with avoiding the memory of the trauma. <coughs> and the treatment of PTSD has something to do with learning the brain that this event belongs to the past. And learning the brain that this event belongs to the past means to activate it shortly and to link it to that what we call the past. Differentiating between the past and the present. That's the trick. Then we talk a little bit of, uh, about your experience with your significant others, that means father, mother, and so on, since we are aware that most of these experiences some, sometimes show up in the therapeutic relationships. And if you have made very bad experience with your father and mother, the possibility that this something is disturbed in your uh, relationship is quite high. And we, wanna, we, we, we cannot use this disturbances. We want to together work on the PTSD problem, so we have to be aware if this is uh, starts to be repeated. This is what we call, in, the, in our language, in therapeutic language, we call it transference, counter-transference, and we simply want to anticipate it and avoid it. Then we explain our patients the model. How does DBT, uh, uh, how does um, a brain process traumatic experiences and how does it work. Then we teach a few antidissociative skills. Why? We figured out that patients with trauma experience, if they run under stress, what they often do, they start to dissociate. And if they start to dissociate, they cannot learn. That's the key issue. Since in a dissociation, our learning capability this is mainly our amygdala and our hippocampus, is blunted. So this means memory storage doesn't work. That means if you are working with uh, somebody, let's say in, in, in processing trauma, you have as a therapist, you have to be c make clear that he doesn't dissociate during the, uh, this, this processing. It's not that complicated since providing strong sensory um, um, <coughs> cues uh, inhibits dissociation. Even if you are standing up on balance boards or something, uh, inhibits um, dissociation. Sorry, I need a little bit of water. <coughs> so this is our educational phase. We help our patients also to learn a bit how to regulate <coughs> exaggerated uh, emotions and mainly how to cope with extensive or yeah, shame, anger, or guilt. This is not that long. We don't call it a stabilization phase. It's mostly two or three sessions. We provide our patients with a lot of materials. We have a manual about 500 patients with about uh, pages with about 150 handouts, a lot of readings. I hope it's written easily so that patients really can understand it. Most of the patients love it. So then we go for the index trauma. Index trauma <coughs> means most of the patients have a, a whole bunch of different traumas. Um, it's rarely the case that they only have one incident. Most of them have, let's say, it, the father has been abusing them and, and sometimes the brother is came then uh, later on something, the, the, they, they choose the wrong friend. So it's a serious, most of them have four, five, six different traumas. And we have to define which trauma do we uh, attack or work with first? And uh, it, we figured out that the most important thing is that you do the worst first. Since if you don't do it, you work with a mediocre trauma, then the worst trauma are activated um, automatically, and the patient is left alone with that. So we start with the trauma that is currently associated with the most distressing emotions and the most dif dysfunctional avoidance and escape behavior. And this is the one we take. We explain it to the patient, and we never had difficulties finding them. Then, the core feature is what we call skills-assisted exposure. This means we look for one of those, and the patient starts to, to write it down in the third person, uh, first writing it and reading it to uh, the therapist. Then, we go for this, uh, uh, we, we, we work for it in, in a in vivo imagination of the trauma, so we help the patient process the memory of this trauma 
as if it would happen right now. And now important, we interrupt this processing uh, every five minutes, every ten minutes and try to, to help the patient to discriminate between his memory, which is active, and the current reality. So questions like, look where you are, uh, do you feel, um, what, what, what do you wear, and, and, and just get reoriented in the reality. This is how the brain is taught to discriminate between present and past. That's how it works. Uh, and then we give the patients homework. This means they have to listen to the tape sessions every week, at least half an hour, every day, sorry, every day, half an hour, and they do it. And we need about five, six repetitions of this session, and then mostly, 80% of the cases, this problem is done. Means the nightmares disappear, the intrusions disappear, and the flashbacks disappear. Then we take the second event, and then we take the third event. So the trauma, the exposure itself is hard since we have, no, the, the idea is not that we just tell it, but we have to reactivate mainly the emotions. These are the trauma related emotions. This is helplessness, disgust, fear, sometimes sexual arousal, this simply happens, yeah? humiliation, threat and confusion. So, and powerlessness, this is the thing. The point is, if the brain learns that the experience of powerlessness from the past is different from powerlessness in the present, helps them to give up guilt and shame. Most of our patients then, after this, this, uh, this exposure, they show up and say, okay, it wasn't my fault. And we say, yes, this was not your fault. They had thought that it was your fault for the last 30, 40 years. The whole life was arranged about this cognition. Why? Since they said, okay, this helped them to understand how it happened. But now they start to understand, okay, it wasn't their fault. It was the father's fault. And it was the father's something. Yeah? And this, it sounds very weird, but it, it, this is the key issue. Okay. Uh, the last phase is what we call acceptance. This means patients start um, from, and, and they, they, they process the, the, the events one time again from a, 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 a compassionate state. They look at themselves as kids and look at them, what would happen to them. They were usually they're crying and the therapist sometimes also cries. And they're sitting there and say, poor child, what happened to you? Yeah, this is simply what happened. It wasn't your fault. You are not bad. You are not worse. You are, you didn't, it, it's not true that you didn't deserve being treated like anybody else. It's just happened. And we cannot change the past. That's also important. We have, to, we have to accept it. Past happened. It doesn't mean that it was good. It just means that it was. And if you go in this acceptance state, then you are able to grieve. And trauma tr uh, treatment has a lot to do with activating grief. And then you have a short phase where you're really grieving. And this feels sad, however it feels very authentic. And it's okay, your therapist is helping you to go through the grief. And then comes this powerful phase where you go for regain your life. This means you have to a little bit check your partnership. And you have to recheck your occupation situation. And you have to renew your social networks. And yeah, now a few data. How much time we have? Um, we have about 13 minutes. For including questions. Uh, including questions. So, make it short. Are there already some questions? Yes, there are. So, I'll make it short, yeah. Uh, to make it simple, the treatment works. Okay? <laughs> no, I think you can do your data. Yeah? Some of it, yeah. Okay, so some of that. The first thing is, what we did is residential treatment. Maybe this sounds a little crazy for you, since uh, in the States it's very rarely that you have residential uh, treatment. I know at McLean you have. In Germany, where I'm living, um, Every, every patient, everybody uh, has free psychotherapy for at least two years. And we have huge, huge distributing residential treatments for those who need and we can, everybody for free, so it's insurance pays for maximum three months of residential treatment as long as it's evidence based and works. And, the good, and we were not very sure when we started with this tough treatment whether our patients even get worse or they start cutting or get suicidal and that. For that, we said, okay, we know how to treat borderline patients under residential conditions, and this is why we start for safety reasons under residential conditions. 
So this is the first RCT. You see here on the left bar uh, our DBT group and we compared it to the treatment as usual waiting list. And um, what we see here, the mean age was 35, quite advanced. The start of the sexual abuse at the age was the age of seven. Uh, Fifty percent reported that it was longer than five years, and it was very severe on the cuffs. The cuffs is the assessment of the severity of the PTSD, and 80 or 90 is extremely high. Yeah. Usually in the States, those outpatient uh, capses are, they start around about 60. This means they are very, very severe patients. And um, since we wanted to know whether it also works for borderline or not, or is borderline too bad or worse, we said, okay, we include everybody, and we had about 50% borderline patients and 50% non-borderline patients, all traumatized, of course. So these are the results. What uh, you see here, the cuts, this means it's a very good uh, decrease in the symptomatology. And I don't know whether you're familiar with this D, D1.4. This is our assessment of the, the power of the treatment. Uh, we say something which is stronger than 0.8 is a very good treatment. There are rarely treatments which are better than 0.8 and 1.4 is extremely good. This is the difference between the treatment as usual and the, and the treatment. And there usually 1.4 is, belongs to the excellent treatments. And um, so and the, the good thing is, is in, under residential conditions, borderline patients are not worse than non-borderline patients. They are even a little bit better. So this is very good news since usually most of the treatments show you, you almost cannot treat borderline patients or you have to wait since they don't cut themselves any longer or, or, or we start, just started from the very scratch. They came up and they don't differ under residential conditions. Yeah? Um, the response rates are, as we say, about 40% have direct response plus 40% remission. This means about 80% have response and remission. It's not only the cuff which getting better, we have also the general borderline um, symptomatology, also the dissociation and the general psychopathology. That means when you treat the OPTSD, the borderline symptomatology decreases significantly. This is very important. This BSL is the borderline symptom list. I have developed it. So this is a good measure on specific borderline pathology like um, I'm feeling different than others, I'm feeling lonely, I'm feeling desperate, I'm ready to kill myself, all this borderline specific stuff. And a reduction of 0.8 is as strong as, as DBT is. So this means if you only treat this, only treating the trauma, a very significant part of borderline pathology just decreases. So this has some impact <laughs> on our thinking about borderline patients. <coughs> You remember this scale? This is the aversive emotions to, regarding to yourself and the trauma. And you see now you have a third bar. And the third bar is our patients after the treatment. And you see that guilt and shame is down to the control. 80% of our patients who started the treatment do not differ from healthy controls regarding guilt and shame after three months. Yeah? There's no reason to do a longer treatment. So safety issues, the good news is, I skipped it, is we had 21 cutters. This means 60% were frequent cutters when they started the treatment. And you see, after a week, this went down to 20%. And the good news is, even if you do a self, uh, 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 rate them patient by patient by patient, we had almost not one patient who get worse during the treatment. We started our exposure here in week four to six, and you see there's no increase in the frequency of self-harming, even in those patients who, who, when they entered the treatment, were self-harming. And the same, same, even if the highly frequent cutters, we have patients who cut themselves in the last week 50, 60 times, they went down to zero, and uh, the urge of self-harm remains. <coughs> this is clear. Since this is a very strong imprint in your brain, your brain knows that self-harm might help. Uh, and whenever you receive stress, you, there's a good suggestion of your brain. You don't have to do it, but your brain makes the suggestion. But you see that the urges don't rise. They stay. And this means that hard, really hard exposure, 
does not increase the urge for self-harm. And it does not increase the urge for, for suicidal ideation. This is what therapists were completely afraid of. And for years, they avoided this kind of exposure since they thought, wow, a sui chronic suicidal patient might kill himself since he's confronted again with, if you do that treatment, it doesn't happen. So the last thing is, <coughs> we were happy. It looked like that it's under residential con uh, condition, it's safe. This encouraged us to design it as an outpatient treatment. Outpatient treatment now means individual treatment, no skills group. The skills are uh, provided in the individual treatment. We have 40 sessions. And we have, again, the data. We compared this treatment with cognitive processing therapy. I am not allowed to give you the data since they are not published. So I only can give you the data of the DBT arm, not the comparison data. OK? You have to live with it. My point, the outcome data of DBT is under outpatient conditions. We have 75% who completed the treatment. Under residential uh, conditions, we have 90% who completed. This means 75%, yeah, is a 25% dropout rate. This is not bad for this complicated treatment. <coughs> However, it's worse than under residential conditions. So now we have to discriminate between what we say intent to treat and complete analysis. Intent to treat means everybody who said, I want to start this treatment, is in the data analysis. Also those who dropped out. And of course, those who dropped out, they didn't get that. <coughs> For that, these so-called intent to treat analysis are a little bit worse than the completer analysis. Completer means those who stay in treatment. You see, we have a treatment response of those who stay in treatment of 80%. And the extremely good news is we have a remission rate of 80%. This means 80% don't show any PTSD symptomatology any longer. And they have been suffering for 20 years in the average of PTSD. The remission rate in the intent to treat is lower. It's 50% since we have 25% dropout. If you look at the CUPS, you remember CUPS is the severity uh, of, uh, the, of, the, of the disorder. This is a little bit for the therapist or the scientist in your group. It's, we have an effect size, intent to treat effect size of 1.4, and we have a complete effect size of 1.8. 1.8 is extremely good. And again, if you look at the borderline symptomatology, the completers go down to 1.4. I've never seen the treatment. Not one, not DBT, not MBT. I'm a complete fan of DBT. However, not one of them has this strong effect sizes on borderline pathology. So we have to reconsider the whole system. So this is, if you conclude, there's strong evidence that DBT PTC is effective under both residential and outpatient conditions. This treatment seems to be quite safe, and we don't have serious adverse, adverse events. Um, so I would say every patient with PPT and a co-occurring PTSD should receive trauma-specific treatment therapy as soon as possible. This does not mean that all these problems are solved, but it's a very a large window of opportunity, and I'm very happy that I invited here at McLean to teach the crew to, do, to, to, to implement this treatment, and they are learning it now, and it will be offered at, the, at, at McLean. Thank you, I hope I did it as you expected. So Dr. Bohas, thank you very much for a, a really wonderful presentation um, on, a, on a really encouraging, um, and with really encouraging data and encouraging results for people who suffered for years. Yes, um, thank you. The, um, I'll start with one um, question that's um, pretty specific, but I think it opens up a big question that you started to refer to. Is it safe to do this? Because there is a there is a widespread mindset, at least here in the United States, that people have to achieve safety, safety from cutting, safety from suicide attempts before they can start to talk about trauma. And there's a little bit of a debate in, in our field about that. Um, and certainly some people who are more focused on PTSD and exposure therapy will sometimes treat people who are still being unsafe, and yet others aren't. 
And, and I want to put it in the context of a real case. So this person says that my daughter was the victim of trauma when she was 14 years old. She's now 17. She hit, kept this hidden from everyone for two years, but recently revealed it um, after several months of residential therapy. While she's done inpatient work dealing with the trauma, she refuses to speak about the trauma and has been told by her therapists and other treaters that they can't really make her process it faster, they can't make her talk about it. And so this mother asks, should, should people be pushing her to talk about the trauma and confront it and deal with it? Or should they simply wait for her to be ready to do that? Okay. So the first thing is, every, almost every victim of um, uh, an abuse uh, feels deep shame, feels guilty, and doesn't want to talk about that. B, if you don't talk about that and you have symptomatology, this means uh, there's a prerequisite that says that if she has flashbacks and she has intrusions and she feels disgusted and so on, yeah, if, you, if she doesn't have, no problem. Uh, but if she has, and I assume she has, yeah, then of course you have to talk with the patient and you have to explain to listen. Somebody who experienced this, yeah, naturally doesn't want to talk about this. However, there is a good treatment. And it may be that this maintenance of the symptomatology really ruins your life. And I would say showing the patients the data and say 80% of those who talk about this and work this through are rid of this problem and within three months. And I would say it's different than pushing. Uh, I would uh, say educating the patients. And you can easily educate a 17-year-old uh, girl and tell her, listen, it's understandable that you don't want to talk about this. However, there's good treatment if you talk about this. So let's work on that. What would help you to talk about it? Okay. I would completely encourage it. Yeah. Great. And I think it's also, <coughs> it's the, from my perspective, it's, it's more the perspective and the fear of the therapist. It's the, yeah, the task of the therapist to have an, 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 an attitude which enables the patients to talk about this. This means that they don't treat trauma as something to hide, something weird, something you don't have to speak about or you have to wait till the time is right. This is simply, I think, all the data show a clear no. So again, I, I want to make the point that what you have just said is very different than what a lot of therapists and practitioners in the United States believe. Yes. And so, so an important question is for people watching this webinar who want access to this treatment, how could they learn more about it or how could they identify a clinic or a residential treatment program that would offer this treatment? Yeah. So the point is, to be frank, the whole thing is brand new. So we just published the data that we could show that there's no increase in, in suicidality, there's no increase in self-harm. Um, so it takes time till data spread into the field. Uh, the, the, the data, then people said, okay, this is only true under residential conditions. Now we have, we have done this large outcome start, uh, outpatient study with 200 patients. It isn't published. So this is very new telling it. So it takes some time. But also in this, pop in this population and outpatient kidney, we did not see an increase in cell harm. So it takes some time till the field learns it. Um, as far as I know, the first and the only clinic that's doing this is McLean. Uh, so go to McLean and ask for it. And uh, the problem, <laughs> I, I, I'm not very familiar with the, the, the complicated healthcare system in the States, so you better ask somebody else. Well, we only have bad news about the healthcare system in the States. <laughs> Maybe we see it too bad. Exactly. Well, I, and I want to make the point that we actually have viewers from all over, over the world. Ah, okay. Can people come to Germany, to your clinic? Yeah, yeah, of course people can to come to Germany. The problem is that they have to speak German. Um, However, they can come to Germany and they can have an individual treatment uh, and talking in English. So if you take them on the, on the ward, there are groups running and the groups are in German, so they cannot really participate. 
If we do it um, outpatient, they, we have English-speaking uh, therapists. Um, we currently are teaching. Uh, it, 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 we have spread it. It's in 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 in, uh, in Holland. We have a clinic. Uh, we are. Yeah, we have some clinics in Germany, in, ha in Hamburg, in Munich, and in, in Heidelberg, uh, and people in Beijing are learning it. We have 200 therapists in Beijing currently learning it. <laughs> wow! But it takes time to this piece. Yeah, that's great. So we are in a situation where it's clear. So I, I am. I, I was also one of those people who are have been teaching. Let's say wait till everybody stabilized and safe, and then go for trauma. I did this for 10 years, but meanwhile. How I say our head is round so that our thinking can change the directions, and I think this is a situation where we have to change our thinking. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you so much for sharing your information. We're out of time today, so we're going to have to stop. I want to let people just know that they can sign up for the next webinar. But um, a big thank you to Dr. Martin Boha.